apologies for that. Um, okay, so um, this is the uh, functional programming and artificial life tutorial. Um, I have already basically said all this, so I don't think we need to dwell on it. Um, as far as an overview of the, um, the tutorial, I'm going to spend the majority of my time giving you an introduction to functional programming in Haskell. Um, and although I'm talking about functional programming, one of the most important um, topics I will be spending a fair amount of time on um, is the topic of monads. And um, this is something that's um, is specific to Haskell. Well, it's not, I mean, it was pioneered in Haskell and is most closely associated with Haskell. Um, and, and I think they, they actually bring something that's really important to the table and are um, important for um, my approach and um, for artificial life research. Um, uh, so let me, let's get started. So let's, let's talk about functional programming. So, um, you know, back in the 1930s, um, Alan Turing very famously um, pioneered the idea of effective computation. He formalized it using an abstract um, machine called the Turing machine, which we probably are all familiar with. You know, those of you who aren't computer scientists, the Turing machine is not a, a physical machine. Um, as I show here, um, it's a, it's a, purely mathematical object. People have found an interesting hobby in this day and age, building these things, actually making them physical, but nevertheless, it's an abstraction. And Turing did this for the sole purpose of um, answering uh, one of the most important open problems in mathematics of the day, um, the so-called decidability problem. And he showed that there, in fact, were um, problems which uh, could not be solved computationally. In particular, a Turing machine could not answer the question of whether another Turing machine on a given input would halt or not halt. And he thought he had done something truly significant. Of course he had, he had done, but, um, but he had been beaten to the punch a, a little bit. Um, simultaneously, or, or just shortly before, um, Alonzo Church on the left um, had invented an alternate formalism for computation called the Lambda Calculus. And, um, and he had, in fact, uh, uh, proved that there the existence of undecidable computations as well. He said there was no lambda calculus expression who could decide the equivalence of two other lambda calculus expressions. And so he had beaten Turing to the punch um, using a completely different approach. And Turing being a good sport rather than, um, I don't know, creating a fuss, he decided the honorable thing to do would be to um, go to Princeton where Church was and do his PhD under Church. And that's in fact what he did. Um, so hey, Church was- Hey Lance? Yes? Um, can I just ask a, a very short favor? Uh, can you put your presentation in full screen? Oh, of course. Um, uh, that, um, okay. Sorry to ruin the flow. <laughs> well, that's all right. I have to find full screen now. I forget which button, pull down menu it's under. Uh, view. That's what I'm looking at now. View. Um, doo -doo -doo. <laughs> no one can help in chat. Open office. Where's? Oh, they think it's a navigator. I'm not in that. I'm in. Um, Oh, or maybe this little, like, there's like a little button that looks like a presentation, maybe? Or slideshow? Is there a slideshow button? <laughs> I, I, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. Happy okay. days. Okay. Perfect. But now I have to somehow move me forward 40 slides in the presentation. You're going to see no. everything. <laughs> okay. All my jokes are going to be ruined. We will close our eyes for the yeah, next close your until eyes. you tell us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back. here we are. Um, <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay, so, um, so let's, let's talk about functional programming. How does it differ from um, what might be called imperative programming? Because I, 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 I don't like giving history lessons. Okay, I do like giving history lessons, but um, that's not why these people are on my slide. Um, uh, Turing, in some sense, is emblematic of the more conventional mode of programming, which is to say imperative programming where programs are viewed as sequences of statements. Each statement performs um, a transformation on state, and the goal of the programmer is to find a tr sequence of these transformations which will uh, uh, lead from an input state to an output state. And that's pretty much the way we, most of us program today. Um, if we program in a language like C, we're basically using that model of computation pioneered by Turing. Now, um, Church did something very different. Um, 
the Lambda calculus um, programs are not sequences of statement which are executed for uh, stateful effect. Um, programs are expressions um, and the expressions represent um, answers to problems we would like to have answers for. Um, and you evaluate expressions and you evaluate re expressions recursively by replacing sub expressions with um, e equal but simpler values. Um, eventually, we, the, the entire expression is reduced to a simplest value and, um, and that's the answer to the problem. And so there's a, it's a completely different way of thinking about programming, not a sequence of stateful actions, but rather as an expression to be evaluated. Um, and, um, you know, they're formally equivalent, but that's less interesting than the fact that they, get, they, 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 they require you to think in very different ways. So, um, functional programming. So what's difference, what, what is difference about a programming language that is designed to do functional programming and, and, and uh, one that's designed to do imperative programming? Well, in functional pro programming, um, functions are first class. And what that means is that um, function values um, can be, new function values can be brought into existence at runtime. In a conventional imperative language, um, function values um, are, uh, must be defined, functions are defined at compile time. And there's a limited ability to refer to function values through function pointers in languages like C, but we can't create entirely new function values at runtime. In functional programming, um, functions are a data type like any other, like ints or strings or chars or bools. And um, new function values are created all the time because there are uh, higher order functions which take function values as arguments and return new functions as values. So these are data type like any other, um, and they lead to um, greater expressiveness in, the, in functional programming languages. Um, in particular, they, they lead to a new method of abstraction. Um, so uh, some of you might be familiar with, in software engineering, there's a term design patterns, where um, you find yourself, um, well, design patterns in, 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 in imperative programming are, are sort of um, idioms or um, habits of coding that are, um, uh, are they're at least formalized by chapters in, uh, as chapters in software engineering textbooks. But functional programmers make a joke at the expense of, 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 of the idea of design patterns because we stay in imperative programming, you have patterns which are basically just idioms or suggestions. In functional programming, the method, the, the languages possess some mechanism for abstracting these things into actual functions. So you have a factory pattern in uh, software engineering, in, um, which is a sort of habit of coding. Um, this is formalized as an actual function map in functional code. Um, there are other things you can do in, with first class functions, the most important of which is currying, which is the ability to apply a function to some subset of its arguments, returning a function of the remaining arguments. And, um, that's worth mentioning. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is functional programming languages are oftentimes called single assignment languages. And I don't like this terminology at all. In fact, it, it, um, it gives pr primacy to the idea of assignment, which is a, a, a stateful change. Um, what they mean when they, they good naturedly mean when they say that functional programming is single assignment is that they would have you believe that a variable, once it's been assigned the value, never, that value never changes. Well, that is indeed true, true but why call the thing a variable if, in, in, then at all? In fact, in functional programming languages, there's only a single mechanism for associating names with values. And those names have to be the formal parameters of a function. When that function is applied to values, um, those values are associated with those names within the body of the function. There is no other mechanism for um, assigning um, values to names. Um, it's just function calls and function and uh, names once they're associated with values always retain those values in the in the in the, in, the, in, the, in their context. The name might have different values in different contexts, but um, but it never changes. So it's not a variable at all. Um, but the most important property of um, functional programming is the last one on this slide. And um, it, it, it has a slide and it's on right in the next slide. And it's termed referential transparency. And um, this is a concept that you, you, you may know if you've studied uh, languages in computer science. Um, what it really means is that um, if a function is applied um, multiple times to the same values, it always has to return the same result, okay? 
Um, now you might think in imperative programming, there are lots of functions which don't behave like this, primarily those involving input and output and randomness. But, um, but to be referentially transparent, a function must possess this property. Another uh, corollary of referential transparency is if a program is referentially transparent, and ex then the value of any expression is um, independent of the order of evaluation of sub expressions. So um, you might think that's not a big deal, but it might surprise you to learn that, um, well, if you're a C programmer, you know that um, if you were sloppy in your use of increment and decrement operators and expressions, um, you could get very different results depending upon the order of evaluation of sub-expressions. And some of you might be thinking, yes, but of course um, there is an order which we understand, but, but that's not true. None appears in, this, in the various C standards. It's unspecified. So um, this is a kind of a gaping hole in C that um, the order of evaluation is unspecified and the value of an expression is, um, is, is order dependent in many cases. So in functional programming, that is strictly precluded. Um, so, um, I basically just said this, um, so what, what's the advantage of referential transparency? Why am I making such a big deal about it? Well, if, a, if code is referentially transparent, then it can be algebraically transformed. It can be treated as mathematics. Um, and this might seem like <clears throat> an academic matter, but, um, in fact, the Haskell compiler a huge section of it involves these algebraic code transformations. They're kind of the secret sauce, which gives Haskell the incredible performance it has. I mean, Haskell is extraordinarily expressive and yet compiles the code, which is competitive with C and other imperative languages. Well, part of the secret sauce is this ability to do powerful compile time optimizations. And you can't do those if the code was not referentially transparent. So let me give you an example of, um, what uh, one of these transformations like might look like. And this is just one of probably hundreds that would appear in um, uh, something like GHC, the Haskell compiler. Um, this particular um, transformation is called deforestation. And what you can see is um, I have a, 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 say a data structure, which is X's and I'm mapping a function G across the X's and that produces a a new instance of the data structure. And then I'm mapping an, a, fun, a second function f across the result. Okay, and we might very well write this ourselves if we were coding, but um, GHC would see this and it would use this um, uh, identity. It would replace these two maps with a single map and it would compose the functions f and g. So g might be adding one and f might be squaring. So instead of adding one to everything in the list and then squaring the resulting list, we, write a we create a function at runtime, which adds one and squares, and we map that single function across the list, avoiding the intermediate data structure, leading to increased efficiency and better cache utilization, things like that. So this is just an example of the kinds of transformations which we can perform at compile time if we, um, if we respect referential transparency. So, um, oops, Haskell. Um, so Haskell is, um, you know, a, 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 it's been evolving over time. Um, it, it, its most direct ancestor was a language called Miranda in the 80s, but, um, but it, you know, it traces its legacy to Lisp, which traces its legacy to Lambda calculus. I mean, the, the pedigree is pretty clear. Um, Haskell and its modern incarnation dates to 1998, which is already, I guess, pretty old. Um, what distinguishes Haskell from um, earlier functional programming languages like Lisp? Well, if you ask students, one of the things that immediately strikes them is pattern matching, which I'll show you an example of in a second. Um, this makes them, you know, functional programming in Lisp can be cumbersome because of its syntax. Haskell has a rich syntax and um, uh, pattern matching um, really makes code much more readable. Um, and uh, we'll see an example of that in the next slide. Um, Haskell is pure functional, single assignment, as I've said before. Um, but the thing which really distinguishes Haskell from um, previous functional programming languages is pre Lisp was, is weakly typed. You know, in fact, it's almost non-typed. I mean, the data type in Lisp and S expression is just a union of all the possible types that the program can, uh, that a symbol can, can, uh, can have, um, uh, can name. In, uh, so it's, it's actually almost not a type at all. Um, and, and, and weakly typed languages generally, um, you know, you find out about a type error at runtime when you attempt to do something stupid like um, add two strings or um, multiply 
uh, or, or, or um, you know, convert a number to, for, to uppercase, you know, that produces a type error. And you would discover those at runtime in weakly typed languages. Um, Haskell strongly typed, um, and, um, and that's only half of the story. Um, you don't have to do type declaration with Haskell. You, you don't have to declare the types of your variables ahead of time. Haskell will infer them from usage, which is absolutely amazing technology. It's like um, the uh, F22 Raptor versus the Sopwith Camel in terms of programming language implementation. The type inference algorithms um, in Haskell are the most important part of the compiler. And the reason that they're so important is that the majority of runtime errors in programming involve inconsistent use of data types. And Haskell catches these errors at compile time. Your code won't compile if it would introduce an error or if it possesses an error of this sort. And the vast majority of programming errors are errors of this sort. Um, that makes Haskell a little bit frustrating to beginners because it can, you know, can produce tears when you're trying to get your first code to compile. Um, but then the, the sort of kind of glib truism people say as well, but if it compiles, then it, then it works. Well, that's not 100% true, of course, but it's true and often enough that it's surprising. Um, it really is the case that type inference and strong typing um, destroys a huge class of programming errors. Um, the other thing that distinguishes Haskell from other uh, functional programming languages is, is Haskell that uses what's called lazy evaluation. And, um, you know, and there are pluses and minuses to lazy evaluation. What is lazy evaluation? Well, um, in uh, most languages are, are employ what's called eager or strict evaluation, and C certainly does, um, which means that before you can apply a function to values, you have to fully evaluate those values. In Haskell, if you apply a function to values, um, what you're going to get is a promise to do that application at some future time if it, if it becomes necessary. So um, values returned by functions are replaced by promises to compute the values if that ever becomes necessary. So when does computation actually happen in a lazy language? Well, um, when a human eye needs to see a value, then it, 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 it creates a backwards chaining process and um, the promises are kind of IOUs, they start being called in. Well, you know, if you have to pay your rent, um, you might end up calling your um, your cousin or your brother, or your uncle, who you loaned money to, and 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 and, and so he so he can ret repay your loan. Um, he in turn might have to call in his loans in order to repay you, and so on. That's what I mean by backward chaining. So um, the uh, the action of output um, printing a value for a human eye c creates this cascade of backward chaining events, promises being forced, and um, evaluation happens. And um, that has two major advantages um, relative to strict evaluation. Um, one, many promises are never, um, are never actually forced. And anybody who's gone to a uh, CVS or a Walgreens or a drugstore and at the checkout counter, you see the, um, the, all the gift cards for Chili's and Amazon and um, uh, I don't know, I'll, a, a Apple store and things like that. And um, I always think that the perfect business model is these business cards because you buy them for people in the holidays who you can't think of anything better to buy for. And you pay $25 or $50 for them. And you give them to them at Christmas or Hanukkah. And um, I am, I, I would like to, I, I am betting that 50% of those gas, of those uh, gift cards are never redeemed. Um, and so it's just, you know, the idea of creating these gift cards when you give them to uncles and aunts at Christmas time and then they lose them in drawers and they're never redeemed. That's just pure profit for the issuers of those cards. That's the way lazy evaluation works. Um, there's a huge amount of wasted computation in imperative languages because certain values that are computed or would be computed in a strict evaluation um, method um, simply are never computed in a lazy system. But that's not even the most um, important um, uh, advantage. The, to understand the most important advantage of lazy evaluation, let's go to the next slide. Um, oops. Um, here's the next slide. It's, it's not quite the next slide, but 
two slides forward. Here's a function in C, which, or a piece of code in C, which any of us might write. It looks like page four of Kerning, Hen, and Ritchie, where what we want to do is read in a file and convert it to uppercase. Um, and it's a perfectly fine program. And I'm not trying to say that Haskell's simpler. It's not. Um, with the, the Haskell code I show on the bottom, um, Haskell code is not really simpler than the C code. Both are approximately the same length. But what the Haskell code is, is modular. In the C code, the, the actions of inputting a character, promoting it to uppercase, and outputting the character are very finely interleaved. Okay? Um, and, um, <clears throat> and of course, that's a very efficient way to do it. In Haskell, <clears throat> in contrast, you know, what I'm doing looks in some sense monstrously stupid. I'm reading the entire file into memory. I'm mapping the function which, con which converts it to uppercase on the file resident in memory, and then I'm outputting the entire file in memory. The, the space utilization of the solution above is, is brilliant. I mean, it, it could theoretically run in, you know, a, a very low um, amount of, of resident memory. Um, whereas the space utilization here is dependent upon the size of the file. It's absurd. Now, this program would be stupid if it were written in a non-lazy language, but it's not written in a non-lazy language, it's written in Haskell. And when the backward chaining evaluation in Haskell, when this code's compiled and when the ex resulting expressions are evaluated using backward chaining required by lazy evaluation, the runtime behavior of this program is essentially the same as this one. So the human gets the nice modular code, the easily understandable code, read the file, map the to upper function across it, and write the file. Highly modular. Um, so this, this um, so lazy evaluation is really the key to writing efficient modular code because modularity generally or oftentimes comes at the expense of efficiency. C forces you to write non-modular code in order to have efficiency. Haskell permits you to write modular code um, and um, without giving up efficiency because of lazy evaluation. Um, I promise to show you pattern matching. This is not so terribly important, but this is the, a function for appending two lists. Um, and, um, oops, sorry, in scheme. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's, Lisp is famously non-readable. I personally, I've been looking at it for 40 years, so it, it's perfectly readable to me. But um, this is the Haskell equivalent down here, and, and this is what I mean by a pattern. Um, these patterns, uh, these are cases that can be that bind against the input. What this says is this, if you uh, to append an empty list um, to another list, the result is just the, the second list. And this is to append a non-empty list whose first element is x, you just cons x to a recursive call of append um, on the tail of the list and the second list. So you probably can understand how this works. The meaning is very clear um, if you understand the syntax. And as I said, this is one of the things that students really appreciate right off. They're, I teach eight weeks of scheme followed by eight weeks of Haskell in my first course. And students are tired of looking at this syntax. And when they see this, they think it's, um, it's revolutionary. I'm not sure it's revolutionary, but it's certainly nice. Um, okay, now this is really the, the thing which um, I'm excited to talk about. Um, and there's a thing maybe um, many of you want to hear about, monads, this famously hard thing from Haskell. Um, they are kind of hard until you learn them and then you look back at them and you think, why was that so hard? Um, but um, I'm going to do my, I'm going to make an attempt to explain them today um, and we'll, we'll see whether I succeed where maybe others have failed in the past. I had to read about 12 monad tutorials before I understood them. Um, but, um, but anyway, um, what are monads? Um, it, it, the, the, the best answer is, is that um, monads are a very weird abstract data type, which um, is an abstract data type for program fragments. Well, what's an abstract data type? Well, some of you with computer science backgrounds know, maybe the, some of you with, without computer science backgrounds don't know, but abstract data types are defined by an interface, a set of functions with which, with which you interact with the instances of the data type and, and not and they're not defined by an implementation. So um, uh, monads are in fact an abstract data type for program fragments and the interface consists of um, uh, functions for creating and combining program fragments. And you can see that might be really, really useful and indeed it is. Um, I won't go over input and output using monads, but there's certain mythology associated with it. No monads don't magically let you do IO in a referentially transparent way. 
um, um, it's more subtle than that. Um, Haskell uses um, an I.O. type to represent uh, the fragments of programs that perform I.O. and it can build programs that do I.O. at runtime, which it will then execute. Now the construction of those programs is, re is, is referentially pure, but the execution is certainly not. So there's no, you know, there's no magic or free lunch going on. Mo monads don't solve an un unsolvable problem for you, but they make it convenient to do input and output in, in a language which is <clears throat> otherwise referentially pure. <clears throat> so what are some examples of monads? Well, um, okay, I'm gonna, here, here, we'll go to the next slide because this is better. Here's, here's the Buddha and he's sitting under his, his tree and he's um, in a state of bliss because he is doing pure mathematics. And, um, and here is the larger, outside of his um, little bubble of, of, of purity is the real world and all its complexities. And here we see how functions in computer science differ from functions in pure mathematics. We need to do I.O. in, in programming. There's, I mean, it would be pointless to do, write programs that don't do I.O. Um, real programs do I.O. Real programs that sometimes involve randomness. I mean, how do, you, how do you do randomness in a function, in a system which is referentially pure? I mean, if, how do you, is, can there be a function random which returns a different value, a random value at every, every time it's invoked? I mean, how is randomness even reconcilable? with the idea of referential transparency. Um, program, real, um, real functions um, sometimes depend on global state. Um, real functions might be non-deterministic. Okay, all these things, um, return, which is to say return um, multiple values, um, all these things differ from, math, from uh, mathematically pure functions and violate referential transparency in some way, or might be thought of as violating it. Um, so here's an example of, um, of, of a monad, and, um, and it's um, a monad which um, represents uh, the return value for functions which might fail. And so um, first I'm going to present it not as a monad at all. Um, it's just a data type. It's called maybe. And it's got, um, and so, you know, when would you use this? Well, you know, for example, if you, uh, if, uh, in, in C, if you try to divide um, an, a number by zero, you get an error. <clears throat> uh, you know, the same is true in Haskell, but we might want to make the return type of such a function um, a maybe type. So if the function succeeds, we can say, well, it succeeded, and we use this just data constructor to represent the answer. But if the function failed, we use the second data constructor, the nothing, which represents failure. So here I'm asking for the head of the list using the list function car name. So it just returns the X because it succeeded. And here I've asked it to take the head of an empty list and this fails. So I return the nothing value. Cutter is the list name for the tail of a list. So when I'm, I apply Cutter to a list of this form, it returns just X's, but Cutter applied to empty list, nothing. So I've used this data type to represent um, the return value uh, for a function which might fail. So far, no monads here. Um, well, how do we write, this is a real function in list, by the way, cat -a -da -da -da, which is the car of the cutter of the cutter of the cutter, which you can see is the fourth element of a list. How do we write a function which will return the fourth element of a list using maybe? Well, this is the way a beginning Haskell student would write it. We define the function catter to be, um, well, we call cutter on the list, and depending upon the result, we pattern match. If it succeeded, we call cutter on the result. If it succeeded again, we call cutter on that result. We call cutter three times here. But if at any point it failed, the whole function fails, okay? So this is not, we're still not in monads yet. This is just common sense, um, pattern matching on the return value, which is the kind of thing you would have to do if the language lacked monads, um, yet provided a, a capability to represent uh, return values which, for functions which might fail. So um, what is a monad? Okay, well, um, monads are really um, values with extra context, and they can be many different things. They can be um, values which are returned by functions which might fail. 
which is which is the maybe data type which we just saw they can be values which um, they can be values which take on values from a set and so represent non-determinism um, they can be values which depend upon an implicit global state or, or excuse me uh, a threaded global state they can be random values okay so they're distinct from ordinary values because they have this extra quality to them it's oftentimes called a context but quality might be a better word and so um you know here i have a little dum dum lollipop and here's the wrap dum dum so uh, a, a, an ordinary value is a and the here's the wrapped value and we can go up and down use and using functions from the monad interface return wraps a value join unwraps it um now what's interesting is um there's uh so this is the the circle here hask this is the set of all types in haskell um now if we have a function like return um which or, or the corresponding type constructor so let's just so for example list is a monad so we can treat um a is a, a basic type in haskell like a int or a bool and um and we can make a monad out of the int by making a list of ints so any type in hask can be wrapped to create a new type which is what i show from this circle and this it can be wrapped any number of times and so this suggests the set of types of ha in Haskell is an infinite tower and that return and join, which wrap and unwrap um, are kind of like an elevator in this infinite tower. And um, I like this slide, but I won't dwell on it. This just shows that the ca category Hask is actually, a, you know, it's a set that can, it's an infinite set which contains itself. And it's got self similarity like this um, Pink Floyd album cover and it's too early in the morning over here for Pink Floyd, but anyway. Um, uh, Hask is an infinite self-similar set. Um, and okay, so we have this idea of wrapping and unwrapping. What else do we need to understand monads? Well, we need to understand what might be called monadic functions. So wrapping and unwrapping are like elevators in this infinite tower of type. Um, monadic functions, which are more important, are like escalators. So imagine a department store where you have elevators and escalators. And what's an escalator? Well, it takes a value, an ordinary value of one type, and it returns a wrapped value of a second type. So, um, I mean, it might take a um, an int here, and it might return a list of chars here. Okay, like a, this, this could return an int. This could be the number seven, and this could be the string of seven x's. Okay, um, so this this is um, what we will call a monadic function takes a value of one type and it returns a wrapped value of, of another type. Um, so here's the real issue. How do we compose these things? Like if they were ordinary functions, we had a function from A to B and B to C, we can compose it to create a function from A to C. But if we have a monadic function, which is an escalator, um, A takes an A and returns a wrapped B. B takes a B and returns a wrapped C. F leaves its argument at the floor above it in the infinite tower. Okay, you'd have to take an elevator down to catch G to go back up to get to C. And that's the fundamental problem with composing monadic functions. And in some sense, viewed this way, it's kind of a trivial problem. Um, how do so this remember that maybe is a monad. So this might be a function which could fail. So um, G is an ordinary function. It can't deal with the value representing failure. So we have to figure out a way for composing functions which can fail. And um, when we have figured out a way of composing functions which can fail, um, we, we, we can create an instance of the monadic type um, in Haskell. And um, fish represents the way we compose monadic functions. And it's and part of the interface for the monad abstract data type. So the fish symbol is used irrespective of the monad, whether it's a maybe monad representing failure, a list monad representing non-determinism, or a state monad representing threaded global state. The interface it presents is the same, and fish is what's used to compose the program fragments which return those types, which only exist because those types are important 
because they give the functionality that computer science and practical programming requires that mathematics by itself doesn't provide. So, um, so here's the big punchline. This is the code we wrote as a beginner without the monads. And here's the code we wrote with, we can write with fish. And look at this, it's, it's modular, it's simple. We literally just compose the functions as if they would, were ordinary functions, not functions which were bulletproofed to provide um, a robust behavior in the case of failure. So um, we get to program as if these functions are just ordinary vanilla functions and compose them in a straightforward way. We don't have to um, describe how the uh, um, output of one is, is presented or uh, we don't have to pattern match on the output of one to let it serve as input to the second. That's implicit in the fish function, Kleisley composition. Um, um, and that's the strength of the monad abstraction. Okay. Um, so here's a second example. Um, and um, so um, how can a program um, use numbers, use random numbers while preserving referential transparency? Um, well, here, I'm actually just a little bit scared that you guys, everybody can still hear me, right? Thumbs up? Okay, good. I was a little bit scared that, um, that, that I was just off the rails because I thought we were going to stop for some questions. Uh, yeah, we can stop for some questions if you Yeah, if let's you stop for to. some questions. That seems like a good, a good place to stop. Um, we have a, a question in the chat asking um, if, the, if uh, categories are equivalent of design pattern, wait, wait, of design patterns in the realm of functional programming. Um, so does, I think that's the question. No, Gian uh, Carlo, you can, uh, oh, um, sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll let him ask. I'm sorry. Apologies. Oh, if Giancarlo wants to unmute himself for the question, you can, but, um, but yeah, go ahead, Lance. It's, it's much less exotic. Um, design patterns are abstracted as ordinary, as higher order functions in functional programming. So um, map is an example of the, I think it's called the factory pattern in, in C++. Um, it, you know, we, we have a list of, of, of foos and we want to create a list of bars by, map, by transforming each foo into a bar using a function. Um, you know, that's a, a, an idiom that happens enough that C++ programmers want to give it a name, factory. But, um, you know, the little bit of a sort of functional programming, I guess it's a little bit of snobbery. Um, these idioms in imperative programming are actual, uh, actually abstracted as just ordinary functions in functional programming. Um, and so we don't need anything so exotic as category theory um, to explain that. Great. Um, does anybody else have any questions? You can uh, raise your hand if, if you'd like. Oh, okay, here's a question in the chat. Um, uh, monads seem much um, like, they seem like really nice abstractions, but from SE perspective, aren't they overheard for code understandability and eventually maintainability? Aren't they hard maybe, I think? I think they are, they are hard. I think there's a learning curve that's steep up front. And I think after you understand them, they're not hard at all. And I know that's not a very satisfactory explanation. Um, but they, as far as them contributing to unreadability, if you don't understand the abstractions, you're not going to understand the code. That's certainly true. But they actually greatly enhance readability. In fact, um, uh, one of the things I'm going to mention very briefly later is that monads can be composed. So if you have three or four or five monads, you can compose them to create a new monad. And this uh, composition of monads was um, initially uh, pioneered by a guy named Phil Wadler, and it was designed to structure large complex programs. And, um, and it really truly um, simplifies them. In fact, I'm gonna show an example of that kind of simplification, as a matter of fact, in the next two or three slides. Um, okay, one last question in the chat. Um, they're just wondering if you had any comments on the, I'm gonna to totally say this wrong, um, in, in dem potency or the referential transparency question. <laughs> Um, potency. Um, item potency, I don't think yeah. I, I've mentioned <laughs> at all. Um, okay. And I mean, I don't want to necessarily 
introduce a new topic that doesn't have much to do with my lecture. But okay. Referential transparency, on the other hand, you know, that's kind of the start. That's why we want, that's why we bother with functional programming. And, um, and just to reiterate, um, it, it's, it's the property of functional code, which allows it to be treated like mathematics and algebraically transformed for increased performance. Great. I think we can uh, move on. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. So um, here's a second example of a monad and um, on also a, a workaround to avoid um, the problem of randomness without violating referential transparency. Um, because, you know, if there ever was a, I mean, apart from input function, get jar, if you had to think of a function in C which violates referential transparency, it would probably be um, the rand function, which returns a random number. I mean, what good is a rand function if it always returns the same number, right? So how can we actually program using random numbers while preserving referential transparency? Well, okay, there is an answer and it should, and, it's, and you could even see that it would be possible in a C program, um, but it would just, and, and that is, um, we know that we're not dealing with real random numbers, we're dealing with pseudo random numbers and pseudo random numbers require a seed. And so if we arranged it so that the random function didn't, took a seed argument and returned a random number and a new seed, then clearly we could, um, we could change every single program in our application to take the seed parameter and to return the pair of the value it used to return and the update of the seed. And this is really cumbersome because even if there might be hundreds or thousands of functions in our um, application, maybe only two or three actually need to call RAND, but they might be called by others who are called by others. The, the data dependencies are such that every function now has to thread the seed. Every function has to return a pair of the value it used to return and the seed. Um, this is clearly you know, horrible. I mean, this is the, you know, the cure is worse than the disease here. Um, but you could do that and you could write um, a code with randomness in a referentially pure way, but we, but we wouldn't want to. So what can we do? Well, there's this beautiful monad called the state monad. And um, it's actually my favorite monad. Um, and, um, and to understand a little bit what it does is here we have a picture of uh, Los Angeles, I presume, you know, back in the fifties or sixties, early sixties, it looks like. And we see the, um, telephone wires and electric wires running down the side of the street, um, ruining the landscape, looking ugly. And then um, here's the same uh, street, I don't know, four years later, five years later, um, after the electric lines have all been buried in an underground conduit. And, um, and look how much prettier everything is, certainly less complicated. So um, this is kind of what the state monad does um, for you. It, um, in, in C, we would, you know, we wouldn't add this extra parameter that every function must thread. We would make it a global, okay? Um, but that's really, even in C, that's considered to be slightly uh, non-kosher. Um, we, we don't, we don't, we're not proud when we have to resort to that trick of using a global to solve a problem like that. Um, but we would do it. Um, Haskell provides a better solution. And, it, and, 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 and here's the subtle idea, let me, let me we don't need to thread the value. We don't need to add an extra argument to every function. We need to change the return type of the function to be the state monad. In other words, we define the, a value to be a value which depends upon this global state. And that's it. Then we use it, we write our programs as we, as we had before for the most part. Um, the only difference is that functions which take values which depend on state now must return values which depend on state. Okay, so um, what we've done is we've taken the threading and we've made it implicit in the data type. And that's the monad trick. We take, in the maybe monad, we take the control required to pattern match on a return value and we made it implicit in the type. Here we've taken the threading and we've made it implicit in the type. And the compiler handles the mechanical part uh, uh, and the programmer is free, is free to think about more interesting things. Um, so let's see how this can help, how the state monad can help us solve the randomness problem. Um, so here's what I said, instead of calling a function which returns a random int, we define a value to be of type random int. And um, the value is treated like any other value. But now functions which use values, values with random types now must return random types. And I'm, I'm talking about a random type, but a random type now is a, a value which um, depends upon a threaded seed. 
So here's, um, this is literally Haskell code for computing a random string of AGCTs. And, um, and it's, it's completely declarative. Um, I define a data type to be, um, you know, this is just a simple enumerated type. Um, and here I define a base to be a random instance of this type. And this is, a, this is just a declaration. It says a base is a random instance of this type. That's actually accomplished through the type signature here. And then, um, well, what's a protein? Actually, what's a, what's a, 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 a DNA molecule of length n? Um, it's just a sequence of the of n of these bases. That's it. That's the code. We're not doing something so much as we're just describing it. We're not calling a function which returns a random number when we need one. We're defining a variable to be of type random, and we're simply using it like we would any other variable. And um, when we when we perform operations combining random variables, the results are random as well. It's all done for us by the monadic type. Um, here's what I meant by talking about comp comp composing monads. You know, there are maybe a dozen total useful monads. Um, maybe there are only six or so that are widely used. But, um, but these can be composed to form new monads. And so if we have a monad which provides a particular kind of, uh, and then the, the unfortunate phrase is effect, um, and we have a second monad which, which provides another effect, we can compose those two monads to create a monad which has both effects. So we can have functions which fail and also in, in, involve randomness simultaneously. And what's beautiful about it is the code mostly doesn't change at all. The only thing we have to change are the uh, type signatures for the data types. Um, the extra machinery required to thread the state to achieve the randomness, the extra machinery required to pattern match on the return value, all that's implicit in the type. Um, and so monadic code is very simple and largely independent of the specific mix of monads, the specific mix of effects that are being employed. And this, um, okay, fair enough. So, um, Em embedded domain specific languages. Now we're going to start to get into the artificial life part of the talk. Um, you know, why, why is this, you know, okay, I think functional programming is just great programming and it's the future of programming, but why a life in particular? Well, um, one of the things that's really easy to do if you have a monadic type, a, an abstract data type representing program fragments, is you can create um, embedded languages. And um, there are two ways to, I mean, okay, there are two interesting topics that immediately emerge as uh, um, when we think about embedded languages. The most common way embedded languages are used in Haskell is that um, the domain knowledge is, um, is represented by a specific set of data types and type classes. And then ha Haskell's um, wonderful type inference technology is used to not enforce it's used to enforce type correctness, but because the types reflect domain knowledge, they, they enforce domain consistency, okay? So um, let me just skip ahead one slide to show you. So this is a very famous episode in, um, in history um, where American spacecraft, um, the Mars Climate Orbiter, um, burned up entering Martian orbit because um, the software components used um, uh, different physical units. Um, the thruster control software reported results in pound seconds, but the trajectory calculation software used newton seconds. And this, you know, was a perfectly f fine functioning um, $600 million spacecraft that burned up entering the Martian atmosphere because of this unit inconsistency. Well, this is precisely the kind of thing you could do with, um, um, with Haskell in an embedded language. And in fact, it has been done. It's called the unit system. It's beautiful. Um, you know, you add pound seconds to pound seconds, you get a result in pound seconds. You add pound seconds to Newton seconds, you get a compile time error. Haskell, if this software had been written in Haskell, it literally wouldn't have compiled. Um, so that's one of the major tricks we can use, uh, um, uh, we can, how we can write embedded languages and use them. I'm gonna emphasize something different though. Um, I'm gonna emphasize the ability to do runtime construction and execution of programs. Um, because this is, in fact, why I chose um, Haskell 
um, to do all my research because I needed this ability. And let's, cons you know, uh, um, I needed the ability to, to construct new program objects at runtime and then execute them. And, you know, this happens all the time in A life. This is the beating heart of Avita. And Avita solves it in a more or less conventional way, the way you probably all would do it if you were tasked with solving this problem. Um, Avita, the programs are bytecode objects, and um, the bytecode is interpreted by a virtual machine. And, um, you know, if I had to do my research in C, that's probably what I would do. Um, but there is an alternative, and it's much easier, and it avoids the tediousness of writing an interpreter, um, and it produces much more efficient code. And that's that we can actually compile into combinators directly, where combinators are these program fragments that the, uh, they're instances of the monadic abstract data type. Um, so in other words, we, we, instead of treating bytecodes as passive data that is interpreted, we um, make the bytecodes into active transformers of the virtual machine state, which is to say, um, so instead of, navig instead of traversing the data structure representing code and, um, and, tr and performing the uh, operations that the bytecodes require to transform state, we, make the st we encapsulate the state in a, something called a continuation, and we make the bytecodes um, functions which transform that state. And then it, um, instead of interpreting code, we simply compose the functions representing the bytecodes of the code and we compile into functions that can simply be executed by applying them to values at runtime. There's no need for an interpreter at all. And um, th this is a really, really nice trick. And it justifies the use of Haskell in a life by itself, as far as I'm concerned. When you combine it with the fact that the monadic code um, ha has a simpler structure, um, you know, these two things together um, um, justify the use of, 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 of Haskell. Okay. So, um, so functional programming and artificial life. Um, so, be, be, you know, because control is implicit in the data type, program structure is simplified. Um, programs which would be arbitrary graphs, directed acyclic graphs, trees, um, are instead just sequences of combinators. Um, and that's because the control, the, the thing which we've expressed through this, these complex topologies, which require the, the branching and the tree structure or the, um, or the DAG, um, the control is implicit in the data type. So programs which would be complex in, um, with non-monadic types become simple sequences of combinators when monadic types are used. And that's really nice. But the main thing is, is that, hey, since programs are now just sequences of combinators, Algorithms, excuse me, processes which copy or translate those programs can are themselves correspondingly simpler. So we can use, we can represent programs as simple sequences of combinators, and we only need, in order to copy and translate such programs, which is what would be required during self replication, we only need programs to, to manipulate um, sequences, not the more complex data structures like trees and DAGs, which would require more complex processes. So it's easier to copy a sequence than a graph on a non-RASP architecture. And monadic code is going to be a sequence, unlike non-monadic code, which where control has not been abstracted into the type. Um, okay, artificial chemistry. Um, you know, an artificial chemistry is a formal system for construction of objects. The um, elementary objects are atoms. Objects are composed using rules. In a typical, in a typical achem, um, objects are strings or graphs. Um, significantly, there's no connection between the objects which are passive and the rules which, um, which act on them. No connection whatsoever. Um, what can we do with Haskell? Well, we can make a combinator chemistry. Atoms are program fragments. Um, the rules are programs. The programs are themselves made of combinators. So the rules are constructible objects. And this makes it possible to build systems with semantic closure in the sense that, you know, Walter Petit and others have talked about. Um, we can build programs that build programs and um, we can um, potentially evolve the rules which govern the chemistry, not just the objects they act on. Um, and, and I, you know, what makes this possible? Well, monads, monads are an abstract data type for representing and combining program fragments. So, um, so clearly um, they have something to say about this. 
Okay. Um, you know, that's the end of the tutorial part of this talk, really. I'm, I'm going to start talking a little bit more about um, my work now. I'm not sure how much time we have left. Uh, we have about a little over 30 minutes, so we're... Oh, wonderful. Uh, then I'm going to have some time to, to talk about this. Um, are there any questions? Maybe we sh I, should, I should take a little break because I know people are... I want, you know, questions will give people a chance to go to the bathroom or get a cup of coffee or, or ask questions. So we can take a little break for questions, I think. All right. If you have any questions, you can uh, raise your hand or, or type something into the chat. <clears throat> All right. So we have one here in the chat. Um, so he, they think for concurrent processing, functional programming is so useful. Do you think agent-based modeling can take advantage of this? Well, the system, um, ironically enough, the system I'm about to describe is agent-based. I call them actors yeah. because um, that's what they were called before there were agents. Um, the actor model is a, a long, it dates back to the early 70s in, in uh, artificial intelligence research. So I'm about to show a concurrent actor-based system that is uh, where, the, where all the behaviors of the actors are uh, constructed from combinators. Very cool. So, yes. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, Austin, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you want it to do, if you want it to evolve the rules of the chemistry instead of just objects like you were just saying in a different kind of language, is that possible or just harder? Or? So, uh, it, it, you know, everything's possible in any language because of the, you know, the Turing equivalence of all programming languages. Um, I. I think Haskell gives, provides huge advantages um, because the monadic type is tailor made for solving this problem in effect. Um, now, can you do all of that in C? Yes. Um, would it be harder? Yes. Could I do it now in C that now that I've done it the first time in Haskell? Probably. Uh, would I have thought about it at all if I had been programming in C? No. C is a, programming languages are not just devices for achieving effects on a computer, they're habits of thinking. When mm -hmm. you're a C programmer, you, co you think in C. These kinds of ideas would never occur to a C programmer. They are the bread and butter of Haskell programming. Interesting. All right, I think that was our last question. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me tell you about my work. And um, uh, I, uh, about, well, for the last five or six years, I've been developing this thing I call object-oriented combinator chemistry. That's the official name. Um, I want to tell you the unofficial name. In my mind, I've been calling it Spock for six years because I just like Star Trek. Um, so we'll, I'll call it Spock for this talk. It's shorter, but object-oriented combinator chemistry. And, um, and what we do is we, um, it's, it's an artificial chemistry or, um, where the elements are, they're not called atoms, they're called actors. That's because I was exposed to the actor model back in the day. And I like calling things actors, not agents or atoms. So actors, um, they're located on a 2D lattice and they're subject to constant random motion. And computations progress when actors interact with other actors in their neighborhoods. Um, there's conservation of mass. Actors are neither created nor destroyed. And the whole system is simulated using the Gillespie algorithm, which those of you in the achem community will probably recognize um what i want to i don't have a slide prepared on this but um i should probably mention um you know i view this as an abstract interface to something like an asynchronous cellular automaton substrate and so there's a very um, firm connection between my work and the work that uh say david ackley is doing on what he calls bespoke physics um so these, you know, he and I are 90% compatible in our viewpoint about the form these things should take. The only way place that he and I differ is that um, he is, and he's going to give a tutorial later in this um, workshop later today, I think. So by all means, please watch him. Um, he's going to describe a programming language for creating what he calls bespoke physics, which are, in my mind, actor models of this sort, which provide abstract interfaces to asynchronous cellular automata. I'm describing a specific bespoke physics and act, using Ackley's terminology. Um, I'm creating a set of combinators, one set of combinators to rule them all, right? Um, I'm creating a set which, um, just like there are elements in chemistry, there are uh, combinators 
and um, we never, which are immutable, and we never need to create new combinators. Everything we want to achieve in our universe is the result of combining this fixed immutable set, just like chemistry in the real world. So that's where he and I differ because he's interested in a, a world of bes different bespoke physics. I'm interested in a single bespoke physics, which has this universal computation ability, universal construction ability. Okay, so that was the digression to describe my relationship with Dave's work. Um, let's continue on, on mine. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Um, I already said this, um, but um, well, maybe I should go back because I think this is an interesting point. Because um, there was this really interesting paper by Michael Arbib way back in 1966 on movable aggregates of complex automata. And, you know, in the question of how to achieve objects of increased complexity in cellular automata is a, or even asynchronous cellular automata is, um, is a hard and difficult question. People like Arbib have been thinking about it for a long time. And Arbib made a very common mistake. He assumed that uh, more complex uh, automata would necessarily um, be represented by larger areas of the substrate. And in order to move them, he further assumed that it would be possible to move an arbitrarily large area of the substrate in order one time, um, order one distance in order one time. And this, this, is, this is fallacious. And, um, uh, and, you know, Dave Ackley has worked very hard on trying to figure out ways to move large aggregate areas in ACA substrates in time proportional to the, the distance moved, which is, and, you know, he's done lots and lots of work on that. And he, it's been, con it's a problem that's consumed him for a couple of years. It's very hard. Um, I make a very different and I think equally defendable assumption in my work. Um, I don't consider more complex automata to be larger in area. I consider them to have increased mass. And when I, I can move, um, and then I, 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 I let the diffusion constant in my simulations um, reflect the mass such that uh, heavier actors move more slowly and that reflects the real cost of copying data in the substrate. And so you can view my, you know, I think this is equally defensible and it, it produces, it, you know, Dave has worked really hard to try to move large areas, um, uh, but he has to synchronize communication over, over large, arbitrary large distances to achieve this. It's really hard. Um, I've, I've, I don't want to say I've punted on that problem. I just, you know, I've worked around it completely by making a completely different assumption, which I think is equally valid. Um, so I think it's worth making that point. Um, so I'm, um, I can, my more complex aggregate, when I compose actors in my model, I get heavier actors which move more slowly instead of larger actors, which are difficult to move at all. Okay, so that's an important point. Um, let's, okay, some of the features of the, the chemistry, there's bonding. Um, um, this is, I guess, important because this will help you think about it. Um, you know, in biology, we have enzymes, and, which, are, which are proteins, and they catalyze reactions, and the enzymes are composed of amino acids, um, and the enzymes can be represented by short loops of DNA called plasmids. Um, in object, in Spock, um, we have, uh, instead of enzymes, we have programs that govern the behavior of actors, rules, and these rules are themselves composed of combinators, okay? Um, and, um, and here's the trick. The rules from which the programs are comprised are themselves actors. And this forgives the semantic closure that Walter Petit talks about, which is to say we can, it makes it possible to build programs that build programs using asynchronous spatial processes. Um, because, um, you know, everything's there, you know, the, and I'll show you, you know, if we, I'll show you a, a demo at the end of this, which um, shows you where I've been going with that. Um, oh, this is an interesting extension since um, my original paper, um, which I which 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 I which I want to talk about now. And so the talk is going to take a, a very dis weird direction, um, and kind of reflects my former life and vision because I was interested in um, in um, actually in, t in surfaces and topology and and, and our, uh, our reasoning about them in vision. But um, I want to build artificial cells, and so um, you know what I've shown you so far in artificial chemistry sort of looks like just a, um, you know, a set of chemicals in solution. Um, where do membranes come from? 
or do we need membranes at all? Well, just like I did a kind of end run around the problem of moving uh, complex aggregates represented as increased areas by inventing the idea of mass, I did an end run around the problem of membrane by inventing um, a data structure for representing the cytoplasm explicitly, and I call that thing a roving pile. And so I don't have membranes, but I do have cytoplasms. So we represent the set of things which are the cytoplasm, not the membrane which separates the cytoplasm from the external volume. Um, and these, um, these, rov these piles, so-called roving piles, are they're the connected components of a lattice relation. I will show you this in a second. And they form isolated domains capable of hosting the message passing computations, which, com which are the basis of, for the artificial chemistry. Um, significantly, the roving piles rove. They randomly evolve and shape and move. They grow and shrink. Um, and repeated random shuffling of neighborhoods within the pile results in collisions between the actors and that um, drives the computation, it's diffusion driven. So let's see some pictures. Um, okay, so this is a lattice. This is a relation on the lattice, which is say a set of edges. And then this is, these are two com connected components of the, the, the lattice relation. And these could be the cytoplasms of two different cells. And um, these actually form what I call the footprint of the cells because the, 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 um, the cytoplasm consists both of this lattice relation, which is the footprint, and also a, a stack of actors on top of it, like stack and checkers. Um, and, um, and that's what permits these things to evolve in shape because without that stacking, um, we couldn't pick up an actor from one point and move it to another. Um, we couldn't do it at all. Um, so um, here's a, here's a animated GIF which shows you two of these roving piles. And you can see they have a really interesting um, behavior. Um, this is all just governed by local operations asynchronously and, um, and they, they sort of look like um, living cells uh, in a sped up movie. Um, okay, this is the part where it gets a little weird. I wanna describe, cause this is, and I, I, this is my, my new work. Um, I want to describe how you can do binary fission using a, a roving pile data structure, because it seems like a pretty hard problem. It was a pretty hard problem. I'm going to describe it for you now, uh, how I solved it. Um, so um, here we have a, a sphere, and we've punctured it twice to create a topological cylinder or annulus. Okay. Um, the convention here is that these double-edged arrows are um, uh, limbs or um, tangents to the lines of sight. So this is a 3D embedding of an annulus or cylinder. And these are two alternate 3D embeddings. I've just topologically transformed them. And then on the right here, I've given you two two-dimensional embeddings of the same object. So you can sort of see how I went from the 3D embedding of the twice punctured sphere to this cone to the 2D embedding. And you can see how I've done it down here too. And the convention here is that the arrows, when you're moving in the direction of the arrow, the surface lies to your right. Um, so the, and the con counterclockwise is there for a hole, clockwise is a solid. So this is an embedding of an annulus. Um, so this is an embedding of a sphere in three dimensions. And I wanna, I'm showing you this picture because um, I wanna contrast it with the next slide because there are certain two-dimensional surfaces which do not have embeddings, most famously the Klein bottle. It does not have an embedding in three space. What it does have is an immersion. An immersion is, uh, is like an embedding, except uh, in, embedding is a one-to-one -one continuous mapping between the surface and the, and the space. The immersion is a one-to-one, -one, is a locally one-to-one -one mapping, locally one-to-one -one continuous mapping between the surface and the space. Um, the mapping has to be one-to-one -one in every neighborhood um, and so the the one to one property is violated where the Klein bottle pierces itself, but these two points are in different neighborhoods of the surface, so everything's kosher. Okay, so why am I showing you immersions? Um, well, because I want to look at the problem of fission in, in roving piles. So here's a mother and a daughter cell visualized as spheres, and they're conjoined, and they're separated by a disc which is the septum, which is a biological term for the, this, this part of, this, of, a, of a bacterium when it's undergoing binary fission. And um, this thing lacks, this thing can't be immersed in the plane as is, but if I puncture the top and the bottom, 
then it's topologically equivalent to this. And this has a planar immersion. I show it here. So this is locally one to one everywhere. Okay, and that's the point. And here's the daughter's cell, here's the mother's cell, and here's the septum. And what and hopefully you can relate it to this picture, which looks more or less less like you know, two cells undergoing binary fission over here. And you can see how I've achieved the same effect in two dimensions using immersions. And these uh, this immersion becomes the footprint of a roving pile. And um, so we can do budding. Here's a here's a mother cell and its immersion in the plane and immersion. And um, here's a daughter cell, which is really tiny. And, um, and we, can, we can perform the operation of transforming from this to this by transforming from this immersion to this in the roving pile. And this makes this look like this is really huge. But this is actually a three by three neighborhood in the, in the pile. And so the bud creation can be performed with a local operation. That's very important. Um, Similarly, fission can, you know, the, 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 the closing of the septum in fission can be performed. Okay, so here we have the, the mother and daughter cell with the septum. The septum shrinks to um, a single pixel, and um, at which point it can be popped out, leaving the separate mother and daughter. Okay, so hopefully you follow those pictures. I worked hard drawing them. I like topology. Um, let's... Um, we can use this as the basis for a new kind of artificial cell, which represents the program on a nucleoid, which is a bonded structure in the chemistry, hosted inside the roving pile. And um, we can use um, two uh, replication forks, which are sets of rules that act on the nucleoid to copy and export it through the septum into the daughter. And um, here's a schematic of that. What I wanna do right now is I want to show you it running. Um, I'm going to see if I can, it's going to take some cleverness because I have to figure out how to share the screen. Okay, I'm going to share the screen now. Um, and, oops, I have to stop sharing the old screen. Yeah, yeah, I think. And um, let me see, stop share. Share, okay, share the new screen. What you're gonna see, I have full-blown cells that work this way, but they take about 20 minutes to replicate and we don't have 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna show you the section which does the uh, plasmid, repli the, the nucleoid replication. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so what you see is, and again, I, I should have made this bigger. Um, what you see is the uh, immersion of um, the mother and the daughter bud with the nucleoid. The nucleoid is this white scraggly thing here. It's a, it's a closed loop of um, combinators representing the actual program, which is doing the copying that you're gonna be see running. So this is not just a visualization. This is not just a, 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 a trick. The program which is gonna be running is the one that's being copied. Um, so here it is. Let me, um, let me start it running for you. And, um, and then you, what you'll see is, is it being copied and exported into the daughter. And um, we'll just watch that. Hopefully that looks like something on your screens. I really should have made it larger. But um, if, if the, the daughter is the blue, the mother's the green, the nucleoid is the white. What you'll eventually see is the blue growing and growing and growing and a, a new copy of the plasmid migrating into the blue um, uh, part of the immersed complex representing the mother and daughter conjoined. Um, it's copying using a pair of replication forks. So this is a parallel copying process. And as I said, the program that's being executed is the one that's actually represented on the plasmid itself. And there you go, boom. Um, so budding, um, copying a plasmid with replication forks, export into a daughter and fission, all done using only local asynchronous operations. Now, all this was devised using this combinator chemistry, but as I said, this is a, I view this as an abstract interface to an asynchronous cellular automaton. No one should be programming in cellular automata these days. I mean, no one wants to build the replication table for this, or the, excuse me, the transition table for an automaton in this complexity would be millions and millions and millions long. Um, you know, we, we, however, you know, if you use a bespoke physics or you use a combinator chemistry, which is a bespoke physics, you can do these ACA computations um, like this. And um, 
anyway, I'm tempted to let you watch that run again, but I probably would have to start a new one and do a screen share again. Let me show you once. Well, actually, we're probably out of time. Um, we have about eight minutes. Let me, I'll show you running one more time so you can enjoy it. Um, uh, yeah, let me. And the, um, the difference between this and the full-blown cell, which I actually have, um, I actually do have working, is the, 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 um, the, the nucleoid, which includes the translation by a ribosome, is probably um, two times as large. And the, the whole demo, instead of taking 60 seconds, takes 15, more like 15 minutes. Um, so um, that's why you're not seeing the, the actual full replication. So here we go again. I mean, oh, you might be wondering what all that white stuff that apparently gets jettisoned is. Um, this, the cell, the, the program um, uses, um, combinators to keep the septum open and it closes the septum by expelling them into the surrounding environment. And so it's kind of excreting the things into the environment, which um, uh, uh, the, the act of excreting the things which comprise the septum, septum into the um, surrounding space closes the septum and then it can be cut. Um, this little green V floating around, which you see, that's actually the um, act, that's the rule which um, uh, cut the septum once it becomes a single site and it's expelled along with the, at the, as the very last step before fission. Um, so I've got a set of cells that work like this. I've got three or four different cells which use um, the, the, these, these, these tricks. And um, I couldn't quite get my act together to, to present this as a research talk, but um, you see it now. Um, and for next day life, um, I'll, I'll have a proper paper prepared on it. And I think that's the um, end of my talk. Let me, um, <clears throat> I have I have a conclusion slide that I want to um, uh, show you. Um, so let's um, let's go back to go back to that. Uh, here we go. Um, And um, aren't we are we seeing the the, the, the slides again or no? Uh, I think we're seeing your browser. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, let me. I think me, the slides might be behind it. Uh, Oh, well, it might not be worthwhile showing the last slide, um, but um, let me try one more time. I think it's like right behind all your browsers. It's the lecture too. There, there, we, there we go. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, no problem. Uh, let me make it full screen. Okay, so this is what I just showed you, and I've got full-blown cells that do everything, the whole and and re replicate robustly over across generations, uh, implemented, and um, I'm happy to show anybody who really is interested in this. I'm happy to show them um, offline, um, and uh, so here's the conclusion. Um, so functional programming languages have many advantages for research in artificial life, and I think the most significant of these is that combinators permit new programs to be constructed and executed at runtime. Um, Monads allow control to be abstracted as a data type, and this results in programs that are simply sequences or combinators. And these combinator sequences can be easily copied and translated by asynchronous spatial processes. You know, I wouldn't have been able to create a system with the uh, semantic closure I demonstrated for you 
um, if programs had a more complex representation because that more complex representation would require more complex processes. It's a vicious cycle. So by making, by simplifying program representation, shorter programs suffice to copy programs. And so that was sort of a trick to achieving um, a semantic closure in a system like this. And um, I like Star Trek, the language is called Spock in my mind anyway. <clears throat> so I had this last slide, which if you're as old as me, you probably think is funny. Um, if there's time for a few questions, um, uh, I'm happy to, to, to answer them. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if people want to uh, um, virtually clap, they can add little reactions. Um, and you can raise your hand if you'd like to, to answer a, or ask a question. Um, Thank you, Lance. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, oh, I think there is a question in the chat. So um, how did you search for or produce these self-replicating structures? Um, I designed them very carefully in the common air chemistry. Um, I mean, they were, my, my research goal, and if you saw my um, lightning talk at um, in Newcastle, my research goal is to, um, make complexity pay for itself by producing more complex objects which replicate faster despite being more complex. This turns out to be really hard, but, um, but you know, I've actually, you know, I've, again, in the, using the things I've just shown you, I've, 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 I've achieved that. And now I have a sequence of replicators of increasing complexity that nevertheless replicate faster than their ancestors by ver despite their increased complexity. And they do that because of uh, spatial parallelism. Um, I, none of this evolved. All of it was done with lots of cleverness on my part, no evolution. So I, but, but I wanna at least emphasize that it was surprisingly hard to even produce a sequence of, uh, of a progression of complex replicators such that the more complex ones were faster than their ancestors. That even applying all my ingenuity was a hard problem. <laughs> Um, okay, one more question. Uh, so is functional programming useful for cellular automata with complex rules um, where mass is not conserved? Um, I, I think I, look, I like, CAs are awesome uh, and they're awesome, you know, they're awesomely simple, but I do believe it, they've, they should be retired from a life right now. Um, and that's only because no one wants to program using transition rules. It's 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 extremely limiting to to uh, program using transition rules. Um, the the comp I I've achieved a complex replicator with semantic closure. If that were and I believe in principle it could be implemented as an asynchronous cellular automaton. The um the my the, the basis for that belief is that I believe you could compile the combinator chemistry into a ACA implementation. I haven't proven that, but everything was designed so that would be in principle possible. Um, I've achieved, you know, I would, I would, it was hard enough coding these things in the very, using the very abstract interface of the combinator chemistry, much less having to worry about coding them as an ACA. So I think as a research endeavor, trying to figure out a way to compile combinator chemistries into ACAs, that's a wonderful research problem. But um, transition tables should be produced by compilers, not human brains. That's for sure. Um, and, and, and to the extent that we as researchers continue to want to um, hand code transition tables, we're just, um, I don't think we're gonna make very much progress. Great, um, I think that was our last question and we ended right on time, which is absolutely perfect. Um, and I just wanna thank you again, Lance. This is a really wonderful tutorial. Um, and virtual clap, <laughs> the awkward Zoom clap. <laughs> I, I will say that I'll put the slides online, of course, in the Slack group. Perfect. And um, I'll probably put Fontana and Buss's paper online too, because some of you might not uh, be familiar with it. And it made such an, had such an impact on my life. Um, I'll put that up there. I'll also put my journal paper up there on um, the combinator chemistry. Lovely. Um, and next on the schedule, we have another tutorial in Lecture Hall A, so you can hop on over there to, to check out that tutorial. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. Thank you.